Hello, everyone. Welcome to CF and Nutrition, a weighty topic. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have an informative session full of information for you. My name is Linda Griffin, and I will be moderating the session this evening. My son, Kian, is 15 years old, and he has cystic fibrosis. I was born and raised in Ireland, but we currently live in Orlando, Florida. I'll be introducing the speakers in two groups as they come up to speak tonight. This session is also being recorded and will be available to all registrants after the event. Before we get started with the session, I want to go over a few items related to the technology and how we can all interact. First, closed captioning is available and should be showing up automatically on your screen. You can hide these subtitles or adjust the view by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. We will be taking audience questions during this session so please submit your questions at any time into the Q&A box. We won't be able to answer questions about individual diagnosis or treatment plans. And we encourage you to use the information you learned today to have conversations with your care team. Otherwise, we'll do our very best to answer as many questions as possible verbally. And we will also be trying to answer questions by typing answers directly into the Q&A box. So check back there if we haven't answered your questions verbally. You'll also, also notice the group chat for everyone who is in the session. Please note you'll want to change the drop down menu so that your message goes to all panelists and attendees. That way, everyone who's in the session can see your comments. If you have a question for the speakers, make sure you use the Q&A box to submit it and not the group chat. If you have any technology problems during the session, please return to the home event homepage and click the live support chat icon on the bottom left of the web page to connect with tech and program support. So let's get started. I'm so pleased to introduce the first two speakers in this session, Dr. D.B. Sanders and Dr. Virginia Stalling. Dr. D.B. Sanders is the Associate Director of the CF Center at Riley Hospital for Children, Indiana University and Indianapolis. Completed medical school and his pediatric residency at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And he completed his fellowship in pediatric pulmonology at the University of Washington, Seattle Children's Hospital. His research focuses on epidemiology and clinical studies of pulmonary exacerbations and early life events that contribute to CF lung disease. Dr. Virginia Stallings is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine and director of the Nutrition Center at Children's Hospital at Philadelphia. Her research interests include pediatric clinical nutrition, evaluation of nutritional status, dietary intake and energy expenditure, and nutrition-related chronic disease. Much of her clinical care, research, and advocacy care are with infants, children, and young adults living with cystic fibrosis. Dr. Sanders will start with his presentation, and then will be followed with Dr. Stallings' presentation. I'll then return to introduce our next two speakers at the end of their presentation. So, Dr. Sanders, if you'd like to welcome and come on the screen to start your presentation. All right. Thank you, Linda, and thanks to everybody who is logging on tonight. Um, my talk is really going to set the stage for the rest of the session. I'll talk about how we've uh, come to the current nutrition guidelines and goals and recommendations, and then give a hint of where we might go going forward, and then hand it off to the other speakers. So I have no disclosures relevant to tonight's talk. Um, and looking at the past, I'm going to jump back to 1964 and um, and mentioned this paper that came out uh, as part of a series of reports from the Cleveland CF Center uh, led by Leroy Matthews and Carl Dorschuk that really um, was one of the first very successful or, or much more successful CF centers and really helped to establish uh, the model we have today. As part of their therapeutic recommendations, they had some dietary recommendations, which I've highlighted here, um, which are a little bit different than what, what I think is standard practice today. Um, they had recommended the high protein diet, but they actually had a restriction on fatty foods. 
Um, but given the success of the, the Cleveland CF Center, a lot of their practices spread widely throughout the, the US, including this one. And I'm gonna jump forward now to 1988, 25 years later, um, when again, we saw in the uh, opening session that life expectancy was, was in the early young 20s for somebody with, with CF. Um, and the Boston Toronto CF centers uh, went and compared their practices to see what they can learn from each other. Uh, one of the things that was notable was that um, the, the Boston diet uh, guidelines reflected what was um, included in this, the Cleveland CF reports from the 1960s. But in contrast, Toronto uh, had recommended more of a high fat uh, diet along with more frequent uh, enzymes with meals. Um, and some of the difference that the two centers noted in their uh, children with CF were that the the boys were, uh, excuse me, the, the children in Toronto were taller than the children in, in Boston. The, they were still below average for height. The average height in Toronto was 40, in the 42nd percentile versus 33rd for Boston. The, the boys weighed more um, uh, than in Toronto than in Boston. But what was really most striking was the difference in survival. Uh, this graph shows the, the survival by age. Um, so higher uh, up the y-axis is better. And you can see that Toronto had the best survival out into the mid 20s uh, compared to Boston, but also compared to the rest of Canada and the United States. And I think that the link between the different dietary guidelines, the different nutritional um, measurements and survival really changed, uh, helped to set the stage to change the practices here in the US. Um, and so that, that became uh, a, a more of the widespread uh, use, I think what, what you're probably familiar with today. Um, and that led to the CF Foundation really tracking even to today, um, FEV1 or lung function as well as uh, BMI or weight for height percentile. Um, and this is this slide from the most recent CF Foundation patient registry report um, that looks at the average, um, excuse me, the, the correlation between FEV1 and BMI uh, percentile in children six to 19 years of age. Um, so for both boys and girls, we see that the, uh, the kids with the youngest, um, excuse me, with the lowest BMI also have the, the lowest FEV1. And this uh, goes up quite a bit in the um, lowest BMI percentiles and then levels off, but continues to increase all the way to the highest levels of, of BMI. So, um, and we can see on here that the CF Foundation has set a goal uh, that everybody be above the 50th percentile. Um, that line was uh, uh, developed uh, through some of the studies I mentioned, but uh, the, uh, the development of guidelines were led by our next speaker, uh, Dr. Janan Stallings and published in 2008. And there were quite a few recommendations. I'm just gonna highlight uh, the ones pertinent to our discussion tonight, which included that um, the goal growth for uh, children with CF uh, below the age of two is to attain a weight for length percentile above the 50th percentile, so at average or above, and then the same for uh, children ages two to 20 years, um, young adults, uh, uh, this time with the BMI greater than the 50th percentile. Uh, the guidelines also included that we're probably gonna have um, our children with CF uh, need to take in more food maybe even up to 200% or double the US are, are recommended daily allowance of calories in order to achieve this goal. And that um, nutritional supplements are gonna be recommended uh, in order to, to get all those calories in. Um, and then the CF Center, uh, in addition to tracking uh, individuals uh, with CF, also um, encouraged CF centers uh, to, uh, to attain this, this uh, uh, goal of having the FEV1 above 100% predicted, as well as the BMI above 50% predicted on average for their, for their patients. And so um, here we see that in the pink dots are the, the CF centers in 2003, where their average FEV1 and BMI were. And you can see there are more of the, the CF centers in the lower right-hand quadrant of this graph. And then when we jumped ahead 10 years to 2013, and the blue dots are more clustered in the, the right side of the graph, and even a few getting the upper right-hand co corner. The slide's a little bit old. The CF Foundation uses a different uh, a graph now, but it's the same sort of uh, tracking and we're trying to, to achieve both these goals simultaneously. In addition to the guidelines and these goals, additional research has gone on to try and figure out additional details around this. Um, one is the timing of, of when do we want all, all of the, the children to meet this goal. Um, Wei Chen Lai uh, looked at data from the Wisconsin Newborn Screening Study and compared a weight for age uh, at age two to the birth uh, weight for age percentile. And so, so for babies that were born larger, they needed to uh, weigh more at age two. For smaller babies, they didn't have to weigh quite as much. It's 
a little bit different than the 50th percentile, but it's, it's trying to take into account uh, some of those in utero uh, growth factors. But what she found was that the children who recovered their birth weight z-score by age two had the best lung function at age six when we can first measure it pretty reliably, reliably with spirometry. If we look even younger, uh, those who have poor growth, uh, this is children with CF have poor growth at age two, uh, are more likely to have lower weight for age at four months of age. So we can, um, if our goal then is to try and maximize lung function by age six, then um, achieving that weight for age goal by age two is important. And even looking back to age four months, um, you can see why we as a CF team are often pushing nutrition so early on in life. Uh, but it's not just about the numbers as well. Even when we looked up uh, at a more recent study in 2013, we see that there's a, an association between survival by age 18 and weight for age at age four. Um, the, the different groups are a little hard to tell here, but this top line here, uh, again, showing a higher is a higher proportion of survival. Uh, the top line are those four-year-olds who had weight above the 50th percentile. And then the lowest group, the one um, with the lowest survival to age 18 were those uh, children who had a weight for age percentile less than the 10th percentile at age four. Um, so still, even since the 1988 report comparing Toronto to Boston, uh, we're seeing this effect and sort of strengthening our resolve to try and um, achieve those goals, uh, weight for age goals early on. I'm not gonna be able to answer the chicken or the egg question. Is it the healthy lungs that allow the kids with CF to grow well, or is it growing well that allows the CF lungs to be healthy? But I, I do wanna to touch base on, on this paper, which I think addresses uh, uh, one hypothesis, which is that good early growth allows for good growth of uh, healthy lung tissue. Um, and so now we're switching from growth percentiles to Z-scores. Um, and so now uh, uh, on this left-hand panel, the height for age Z-score averages zero, um, and this looks at six-year-olds in the CF Foundation Patient Registry from 1994 to 2012. So the, this first dot over here are the six-year-olds in 1994. You can see that on average, um, they're shorter than average six-year-olds. And then the six-year-olds in 2012 have made progress, still below average, but definitely higher than those six-year-olds in 1994. Similarly, we see gains in FEV1 over that same time span. Again, here for FEV1 uh, in the open circles, uh, we, the six-year-olds in 1994 started a, um, a full Z-score below average. Um, and just for uh, reference, a Z-score of minus two would be about 80% predicted. That, uh, that um, average FEV1 has increased uh, nicely uh, uh, and has increased even for, further in the last 10 years. The other um, figure, excuse me, the other data point we have on this chart, middle chart is the FVC in the black dots. You can see that from in 2012, FVC is actually achieving uh, average, the FVC is the full breath that's blown out during spirometry uh, measurements. Um, and one way to look at um, severity of CF lung disease is to compare FEV1 to FVC and look at the ratio. And in contrast to height in FEV1 and FVC, the ratio of FEV1 to FVC really didn't change over that time frame. So this would suggest that we're not seeing globally um, improved uh, airflow obstruction or, or disease in these six-year-olds who, who should have mild disease. Um, but, but rather what we're seeing is more lungs, uh, more healthy lungs that are um, present and allow for being able to tolerate small, small areas that are being uh, uh, injured. Um, so far, mostly I've talked about some of the research that led to, uh, to some of the guidelines, but I also wanna mention some of our interventions. And um, of course, we've heard about the improvements with Trikafta and Clydeco. The one I wanted to talk about was, was G-tubes just briefly. Uh, the foundation has some nice resources and I've linked to one here on the, on the slide. Um, I think in contrast to oftentimes, I, I think it, it, um, families feel like a G-tube is a punishment or a failure, but um, the CF Foundation has some nice guidelines that's really meant to be used as a tool to help achieve our weight goals. Um, the CF Foundation has a pretty thorough document on uh, G2, the use of G-tubes to attain our nutritional goals, and they, they do recommend a thorough evaluation prior to placement. G-tubes can be helpful in overcoming that need for extra calories that we've seen that people with CF have. Periods of lack of appetite or those toddler feeding battles that are inevitable, um, but really can be really crucial in uh, the young kids who are not gaining weight as well as G-tubes can help overcome sometimes the nausea, vomiting, and delayed gastric emptying that we just heard about in the, uh, the GI session. 
And again, it's not necessarily meant to be a permanent solution. I know that's something that's that's always a concern. Um, but if we can overcome whatever is limiting or get get to achieve those goals, um, then it's something that can come out. All right. So I'm going to switch now to to, to leading to the to the, to the future. And I, you guys are all well aware of the improvements in weight and BMI with uh, highly effective modulators such as Clydeco and Trikafta. Uh, I'm just showing these slides just as a reminder that the weight uh, comes on pretty quickly in the first 12 to 16 weeks, then does start to plateau uh, on, on average. Um, and so uh, obviously this is helpful in meeting our goals, but also gives us some room to start to fine tune our recommendations and really making sure we're getting in the sweet spot of uh, maxim or optimizing nutrition and not just maximizing nutrition. And I think there is some data developing that maybe, um, you know, we need to not only worry about being underweight, but overweight as well. Um, and so if we go back to Toronto and look at their uh, adults from 1985 to 2011, they saw the percent of their population that, that was underweight cut in half. On the other side, uh, the percent that was obese increased from 7% to 18% of their adults. Um, and now there are things we've never had to worry about before with CF, including high cholesterol. Um, and so almost half of their overweight and obese uh, patients had evidence of high cholesterol. Then I like to show this graph on the right um, that just shows sort of the, the decreasing returns we get um, in terms of the relationship between BMI and FEV1 as we get out of the underweight where just small increases in BMI are associated with, with large increases in FEV1 into the adequate and overweight where those changes aren't quite as um, impressive. Um, and maybe uh, in the future, uh, if uh, I guess one question that has often come up is these recommendations true for both people with CF or pancreatic insufficient, but also those who are pancreatic sufficient. And Eric Forno and his group in Pittsburgh have a paper coming out soon that says, maybe that's not the case. So this, this is the same graph for the, the children with CF or pancreatic insufficient showing the correlation between FPV1 on the y-axis and, and BMI on the x-axis. And so again, we see that the large increase in FPV1 in the underweight category, but the FPV1 continues to increase for the pancreatic insufficient patients, even into the overweight category. In contrast, for children who are pancreatic sufficient, um, that, that really steep decline in the under, underweight group is not seen for FEV1. Um, so maybe we have a little bit more room for maneuver for kids with pancreatic sufficient. And if Trikafta is gonna really restore some of that function, maybe we have a little bit more room um, for improvement uh, in, in the future. We're not ready to make those recommendations just yet, but I think that we're um, starting to work on the tools so that we, so that we can help all of our patients, if they're on modulators or not, they're underweight or overweight. So my final slide is uh, just to say going forward, we're, we're gonna need to be able to work as a team um, to help uh, people with CF who are on underweight or overweight. Um, I still think that above average is, is the, the target until we, uh, um, some of these studies can be completed and we can really uh, get to know better uh, what we're aiming for. Um, the rest of this session and throughout ResearchCon, there yeah, will be more details to come, not just on BMI and weight, but also body composition. Uh, what's known about dietary recommendations for people with CF, working with this CF team. And then I'm just going to close with a, a caveat that, um, that I had heard from, uh, from one of the gastroenterologists that um, sometimes this weight gain can be very concerning, especially with Trikafta. Uh, and one thing we don't want to do is um, overdo cutting back on enzyme dosing and rely on malabsorption to lose some of that weight. So, um, so we're working in, in the GI session that just happened. They're talking about some of the things they're doing to move forward with this. Um, so I'm going to stop here actually and hand off to our next speaker who's going to uh, talk about the next steps. So I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Uh, Janan Stallings, who will give uh, our next talk. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Good. Very good. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll put up the next set of slides. It's always wonderful when technology works. Uh, first, thanks to Linda and to DB. I'm delighted to be here tonight. This is my, re my first research con, and I've really enjoyed getting to know uh, about the event and really about what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so here are my disclosures, nothing really pertinent to tonight's um, presentation, and most of my work really is in CF. Um, 
So the overview, what I want to cover in my few minutes really is just to carry on from what DBE is, uh, has presented as our introduction, a little bit more on nutrition and health outcomes uh, in people with CF. And then to think about what are we doing right now in our current nutritional status? How did we get here? And then lastly, to spend a little bit of time on what I think we're gonna be doing uh, in the future. Okay, so this is a slide that I, I do like to show. It's a few years old now, but it was really a good example of CF is really complicated. So this is a data set from uh, our patients who have Delta F508 homozygous mutations. And so we think of that, well, everybody's got the same mutation, maybe they're gonna have the same disease course. And this was one of the first times that we really saw so clearly. If you look at this, this figure on the bottom, it's age. So from very young children up to 20 years and 40 years, and then on the side part is the FED1 or the lung disease. And if you look at the line I've drawn at age 20, you can see we had this wonderful cluster of people who with, my, with mild disease who were 20, but we also had a cluster of patients with really quite severe disease at that same age. So part of what all this was about, or what are those other influences on clinical outcomes in our disease uh, as we've learned more and more about the mutations. And certainly nutrition is one of those influences. Now, DB introduced these, um, these two graphs. And just to, to emphasize the core point, uh, what we talk about achieving in this one for school-age children, six to nine-year-olds, over on the right-hand side, you see that the, um, the FEV1 values are fairly straight. And then it was finding the cut point, if you will, of the 50th percentile, where then you start to see the decline, the slope downward in the lung function. And again, this is, this is observational data, but DB gave you know, a really excellent story about the chicken or the egg and that we are beginning to believe, we may not be able to solve that question, but it is really important to have good nutritional status, to grow tall, and to have adequate weight for your height. And that is uh, associated with, with healthier lungs. Now, when we looked at adults uh, using this, this same approach, of course, by the time you're here, the, the data um, are for 20 to 40 year olds. Um, when we looked at this, of course, when you're 20, the, the average FEV1 has already declined some. But you can see that relative plateau on the right side, and then quite a steep decline, <clears throat> excuse me, on the, uh, the slope over on the left. Uh, because men and women are different in many ways, and the data really did lead us to set a different value uh, for our female patients than our male. But they're both in that sort of low normal BMI um, for all of us. Now, how did we, how did we get there? Uh, I think it's important, again, as, as we think about what, what we've accomplished over the last years, and this is a table I made uh, that has about 15 years of data starting in 2004 through the most recent data uh, from the CF patient registry, which is a phenomenal resource uh, for us all. So what I wanted to point out is, if you look at the top line, the weight below the 10th percentile is, is too low. And but what you see that we've gone from about 20% of the patients being in that category, now up to only 10. A height at the fifth percentile uh, would, would again be short stature, not appropriate for most patients with CF. And that's gone down from about 15% to about nine or 10%. That's spectacular progress. Uh, and really was a rate we couldn't have imagined. And much of this work was done before the modulator therapy uh, because Ivacafta really didn't get into clinical care until 2013 or 14. What I wanna point out is how important sort of our standard approaches to nutrition care have been to this. And again, as DB mentioned, we really consider 
um, when we need it, supplemental tube feeding is a key part of care. Uh, often, sometimes just over a few months or years during um, someone's clinical course. But for many years across the country, about 10% of our patients have required tube feeding help. And then on top of that, uh, another 40, 45% of patients have really needed help and use what we call the oral nutrition um, recommendations that the dietitians are also always helping. Thinking of the adults, um, about half of them are meeting their BMI requirements, which is really wonderful, uh, but the other half are not. And just to mention that CF-related uh, diabetes uh, is also something that we um, have more and more awareness of and how that's part of the nutrition story. So very much back to basics. We, we are completely dependent on having really accurate height and weight measurements. And here you see kids in my uh, research lab and helping us demonstrate this. So never underestimate the importance of that. And we take measurements every time we see you almost, and we want to plot them on the growth curves. And with this, we really can compare uh, the growth velocity, what's happening over time. And it helps us understand when we need to talk about potentially more intervention or when we need to just sit back and applaud uh, the success. And certainly we follow both weight and height. And then the BMI is uh, a derivative of those, those two pieces. So part of what we wanted to do tonight uh, was also to begin to talk a little bit more about the future. And one of the things I want to introduce is in the future, it's not gonna be just about body weight. Um, we wanna now start thinking a little bit more specifically. And when you think about it, our weight is generally made up of our muscles, uh, our bones, and adipose tissue or the, the fat uh, that we store as uh, in states of good health. So if you look over on the right in this, um, the column that says tissue organ level, that really emphasizes that. And these are the areas that we're gonna be thinking more about and trying to be more precise in uh, our monitoring and then more precise in being able to tell if what we're doing is leading us to really healthy body composition. Uh, and lastly, on this figure over on the far right, it also reminds us that in addition to those compartments, it really is, well, where is that healthy fat being laid down? Is it on your trunk, on your belly, on your hips? Is it on your arms and legs? And we know a good bit about the health and the health risk from where you lay down your fat um, for many other conditions. And now we need to start learning about that for CF. And basically our idea is what's the best way for individuals. Now, most people don't know that uh, we really change our body composition very naturally uh, as we age. And this is a figure that comes from healthy children and showing the pattern of changes in body fat here shown as the percent of body fat uh, from birth up to about 10 years of age. Um, and you can see the, the circles are the female, females and the squares are the males. And what you see is sort of what you might remember from early uh, childhood that babies can be born a little on the thin side, but they really get chubby and uh, look like that healthy chubby baby around five or six months of age. And then their body composition starts to change. They start to have more muscle and the percent goes down. The other interesting thing that this shows is as early as six or seven years of age, we begin to see the changes in body composition in boys and girls. Um, and in some ways, this is sort of a prepubital um, growth period. And certainly it gets more accentuated when we get into puberty. Now, how are we gonna do this? What can we do that's gonna make us more able to understand um, healthy growth, healthy fat, strong muscles. And I just wanted to show you this slide, which is a way of measuring the fat stores, the, what we call the subcutaneous fat stores just under the skin. 
On the left, what you're looking at is someone's back and that's measuring the little bit of fat right by um, the, the scapular. And they're you know, with a little instrument that's a caliper and measures very, very accurately. And then on the right, you see measuring at the back of the arm, um, just over the tricep muscles. And we know a lot about um, what is a healthy pattern and what's a healthy amount from uh, studying children in good health and children with many other uh, chronic diseases. So to move that even a little further, uh, you may be familiar with the DEXA scan because we've really been using this more and more in CF uh, over the last few years related to bone health because we are worried about uh, optimizing bone health and preventing osteoporosis and preventing bone fractures. But one of the things that this has offered uh, for us in pediatrics is a chance to look at body composition uh, at the whole body level. Often uh, when you're by age and I get my DEXA scan, they're looking at my spine and my hips because it goes to looking at uh, fracture risk. We can use a DEXA scan to really start to understand where the fat and the muscles are, how much they are, and what changes are over relatively short periods of time. I, um, I can often tell if my patient is right-handed or left-handed by looking at their DEXA scan and seeing which arm has more muscle and less fat. Another instrument that's right now really research only, but this is a really small CT scanner. Uh, and you can see my colleague here in the lab measuring a little boy where we look at the forearm. Um, and very non-invasive and able to do this uh, at this point for, for research. But I wanted to show you the kinds of things we can see here. So if you start over on the left where the, the cut of the, the picture of the arm, through the arm, shows the big circle of the, the whole arm and then the, the reddish pink area uh, in both of the bones. And that's very near the wrist. And that's where we have what we call the trabecular bone or the lacy kind of bone um, also where you might be more at, at risk for having a fracture. And then you move to the middle, it's up just a little bit further. And now you see the bright white circle, which is what we call cortical bone, much stronger at that point. And then in the middle of the arm over on the right, now you see it's just almost all bone and it's the hard cortical bone. The other thing I wanted to point out here is you see the darker gray circle. That's an, that is um, documenting where the subcutaneous fat is in this forearm. So again, with this technology, we're able to really look at bones, muscles, and fat, and maybe something more and more in research that may lead to some clinical improvements. So one of the core things I always think about and I think is central to when I do my research and clinical work with chronic disease, it's about when you have a time when a child um, has growth failure. And here you see um, a, a figure of the height uh, over uh, by age and think of this as a bits and pieces of the growth chart and the dark line shows what happens to the patient. Things were going fine up until about five or six. And then you can see the height growth just about stopped. And then there was an intervention. And then you see the height growth starts. And in fact, it, it increases at a more rapid rate. And that's the catch-up growth that we often talk about. And when our patients are a bit behind, this is really what we want. We want an intervention that helps with weight gain and height grade growth. To mention uh, for the height growth, we always clinically keep in mind the age of the patient and where they are in their pubital development. On the left-hand side, you see a hand uh, and wrist film. And if you see the bright white bones, but you see there's still a good bit of space between them. And then you look over on the right and you see all those bones have pretty much grown together. That's an indication that the patient started through puberty and really an indication that there's not gonna be that much more potential for linear growth. So again, when we're keeping up with all of these charts and thinking about care and intervention, that's another thing we certainly consider. 
So thinking a bit more about the future, just showing some of the uh, other technology, but particularly the hand grip strength uh, picture there in the right. This is something that may be in clinic um, sooner than we may think because we're really able to measure it. Uh, we've got very good reference data and it's a really good indicator of functional improvement uh, with nutritional status. So something maybe to go with our growth chart and uh, skin fold calibers. And this is just one slide related to that showing these different levels. Uh, this was a study we did uh, on patients uh, early on on Ivacaftor. And in the, the red box, <coughs> excuse me, you see the uh, sort of the typical things. Here's the height and weight and BMI. And in the red, in the uh, yellow box, then you see what I've been talking about. I could talk about fat free mass versus fat mass, what the percent body fat was. And then down in the black box, some of these more experimental things, uh, including the one that says maximum right grip strength uh, that I mentioned as a hand grip uh, indicator. So to summarize um, this part of our, our session, um, as DB said, and, and our whole team uh, would agree with that optimizing nutritional status is and will remain a key component of CF care, both for children and adults. And core to the issue for children is we wanna make sure that the linear growth um, is to the genetic potential of the child. We don't want our, our patients to have short stature. When we think about the future, we think there's gonna be more and more focus on a healthy individualized diet, diet patterns. Now, maybe not just eat all the fat you can, but we're gonna start talking about healthy fats and diet patterns. We very much, for patients who are um, pancreatic insufficient, continuing the pancreatic enzymes to match the dietary fat load so that that works well. And to always keep in mind that we want to have effective oral uh, and tube-based nutrition support when it's indicated. So part of our goal, part of our future is this concept of what's the best healthy way uh, for all people with CF and how do we start to individualize that? So what to expect? Got to expect a lot more of those growth measurements when, uh, when you're a child, both weight and height. Uh, weight measurements in adults is critically important. It's often an early sign that something's not going so well. We're gonna probably pay more attention to pubertal development and make sure we think of that as we do interventions. And we expect that we'll be able to learn more about body composition and healthy body composition and functional tests that will help us guide uh, clinical care. So that's the end of my talk. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I think, Linda, we go back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. And thank you, Dr. Stallings. Um, we really appreciate that uh, presentation. Great information. We will um, have you guys join us later for um, some Q&A. As a reminder to our attendees, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so we can answer them uh, later on and, or somebody can type in the question or the answer for you. Now I would like to welcome our other two speakers, Nicholas Kelly and Jordan Rothesen. Nicholas and Jordan are both registered dietitians. They both have master's degrees in food and nutrition and they both have cystic fibrosis. Welcome to you both. We're so pleased to have you join us this evening. Um, is Jordan on here? Jordan, are you up here? I'm here. Okay, I see you now. Well, Jordan, um, I'm gonna get started with a question for you. Um, what is body image? And what are some things that impact body, the body image, especially for people with CF? That's a great question, Linda. Um, before I share the answer to that question, I just want to um, tell everyone a little bit about why I'm so passionate about body image. Um, I was a part of the Cystic Fibrosis Reproductive and Sexual Health Collaborative. Um, we support patient-centered research and conversations about issues that impact women with CF. 
And in 2020, last year, um, I helped write a guide for sexual and reproductive health. Um, and I worked specifically on the body image topic sheet. So um, I've looked at a lot of research when it comes to body image. And so I'm really thankful that we're talking about that tonight. So in order to answer your question, what is body image? Um, the definition of body image is it's the subjective picture or the mental image of one's own body image that's established both by self-observation, so what you see, um, and also by noting the reactions of others. So some of the things that can impact body image of people with CF, I think a lot of the time we think it's just weight, um, but there are a lot of things that actually can affect it, including bloating or a distended belly, um, the clubbing of fingers, weight loss or weight gain that may be affected by steroids or modulators. Um, the, uh, if you have a port or a feeding tube or scars, um, if you wear oxygen, um, if you have you know, different posture, if you have short stature, thinning of hair, I could go on and on and on. There's, there's quite a bit of things actually. Um, what we do know as well, kind of what the research tells us um, is that body image can be or can affect males and females differently. So for males, um, this is pre-modulators. So this is important to know. Um, those who identify as male are more likely to adhere to nutritional recommendations because they typically favor a larger body form. So that more muscular kind of V-shaped form. Um, along the same lines, those who identify as male are also more likely to have a worse body image because they're on the thinner side. Again, that's pre-modulators. Um, those who identify as female, on the other hand, tend to have a better body image given the preference for a lower body weight um, and the belief in our society that being thin is attractive. Um, therefore, they may also be less likely to adhere to nutritional recommendations in order to keep that body weight. Um, but I think it's really important to mention here that we don't have a lot of current research on body image, especially with the addition of modulators. Um, and the experiences and feelings about body image are not the same for everyone. This is just a very um, generalized view. Nick, Jordan has shared a lot here. Does what Jordan shared match up with your experience working with people with CF? Or what additional thoughts do you have on body image? So first, hello, everyone. Uh, my experience, as Jordan eloquently put it, there is so much that goes into the idea of body image and how that affects a person. Um, for me, one of the biggest things I always found interesting is that viewpoint of how men and women differ as far as their body image. In many ways, body image issues is not something that are associated with men. They don't, we're not often thought about it as much, but I would even contend that that issue of having the idea of what beauty looks like and what those standards look like for men are something that can play heavily into it as, yes, they want the bigger stature, but they likely could have that image of issues for because they are smaller in stature or because they want to achieve a certain body build. And that often is something that I don't think a lot of people take into consideration when thinking about the parallels between men and women when it comes to body image. And as Jordan mentioned, there are so many aspects that associate with body image, you know, the scars, teeth, medical devices, all these things play a huge portion in how a person views themselves, how a person identifies about themselves, and how that ultimately will affect their body image based on how the outside world uh, perceives the things that are happening with them. Jordan, you mentioned several things that affect the body image of people with CF. Can you tell us more about the impacts of taking steroids, uh, transplants, and modulators on, the, on body image? Absolutely. When it comes to being post-transplant, um, there are many aspects of having a transplant that can impact body image. You know, the operation itself results in scarring. Um, so the steroids that we, you know, take after um, having a transplant can also cause an increase in appetite as well as, you know, possible facial swelling. Um, if you've heard of, you know, the moon face, that's very common. Um, some of the immunosuppressants that are required after a transplant are also known to increase hair growth all over the body. Um, this can be particularly difficult for women to cope with. 
Um, they also have side effects like hair thinning and tremors. Um, and many people really fight to put on weight pre-transplant. Um, therefore, the ability to gain weight after a transplant can be viewed as a huge positive or negative, really depending on the person and what their goals were. Um, when it comes to modulators, there's not really a lot of, um, not many published studies just yet surrounding weight gain and modulators. I think we're definitely on the cusp of that. Um, there is some out there though. So clinical trials do show that on Ivacaftor, which is one of the medications found in the CFTR modulator therapies, um, that weight gain was evident for those on the drug by week eight of the trial versus those on the placebo. Um, and the finding was true across you know, a range of adolescents, young adults, and older adults as well. Um, we also know that after taking CFTR modulator therapy, that adults with CF um, can see significant improvements in three different areas, those of which are perception of eating, body image perception, and issues with weight gain. So we see improvements in those. But as we also know from talking to people with CF who have been on these CFTR modulators, that the weight gain can also contribute negatively to body image. Um, I know that you know, many people may wonder how taking these modulator therapies can cause such a drastic increase in weight. Um, and there is a study demonstrating that weight gain post ivacaptor suggests that the weight gain occurs um, due to a combination of increased fat intake that's required with each dose, um, as well as decreased resting energy expenditure, improved fat absorption, and reduced gut inflammation, all of which are really good things. So it's important to note that the weight gain is happening because our body is actually functioning as it should, which is really awesome. I wanted to ask both of you, um, based on your experience as registered dietitians, how does body image affect mental and emotional health? Nick, uh, let's start with you. That's a fantastic question, and it affects it in so many ways. Everyone always thinks, you know, you look good, feel good. But the opposite of that, if you feel bad, you can look bad, and if you look bad, you can feel bad. You know, there is a parallel with how the mind and the body work, and, and that's a really big part of this conversation. It's a get, big component when you really start analyzing the different avenues when we start analyzing this health, the body image, you know, with Trikafta, uh, a lot of people gain that weight, as Jordan mentioned, although it might be healthy weight, many people feel like, I don't feel like myself, you know, even if it's healthy, the pounds, it's like, I knew what my body was then, it's very similar to some people, how they get transplant, and they feel like, I knew what my lungs were then, even if these new ones are better, so I think that's an important part of this conversation, is understanding the mental and toll it's going to take that the physical toll is putting on the mental. Right, absolutely. Um, Jordan, would you share um, what your experience has been? Absolutely. Um, I think Nick had great points there, and I'm just going to share a little bit about some of the data that we have um, regarding the prevalence of body image issues and kind of how that can affect mental um, health. So. Some studies have reported that people with CF are actually at an increased risk of eating disorders. Um, and you know, a lot of that can be in relation to body image. Um, some studies report that the prevalence of eating disorder in people with CF does not differ from the rates of the general population. So we need a little bit more research there, but it's important to note that eating disorders actually affect about 9% of the US population. Um, the intense dietary regimens that are followed by those with CF, that high calorie, high protein diet, the pressure to always be eating, um, that can really affect our mental, our mental and our physical health. Um, we also know that you know, poor body image can lead to an increased likelihood of disordered eating practices. Um, ultimately, a poor body image can also affect a person's decision to be compliant with certain treatments. Even ones like these modulators that are so amazing that are changing our health for the better. Some people are really tempted to not take them because of weight gain and having a poor body image. Um, I do want to mention here that Alexandra Cass, an, uh, a doctor, she'll actually be presenting more on the topic of disordered eating and chronic diseases at the Nutrition Roundtable on Saturday. So I would really encourage everyone to attend. I know it's going to be a great session. Awesome. Thank you. Um, 
I would love to know more about your um, healthy eating philosophy. How do you teach healthy eating and how do you keep it in practice? Nick, if you could uh, start us off, please. So as a dietitian, I have very few hard lines when it comes to food. As the first thing I always tell clients is food is meant to be enjoyed. Food is meant to be an enjoyable process. There are no good foods. There are no bad foods. They're just foods. You have healthy choices and less healthy choices. And so with that idea, I always pride myself on a realistic approach with balance. An example of this is what I like to call my chocolate cake example. So say we have a patient who loves chocolate cake and every day they eat a piece this big seven days a week. The first thing I'm going to go in there when I'm talking to them, I'm not going to say, hey, don't eat that chocolate cake because they're going to be like, no, who are you? And I'm also not going to tell them instead of the chocolate cake, eat that chocolate rice cake. Why? Because you sound silly and anyone who does that, you sound silly doing it. So what I'm going to do is say instead of eating that chocolate cake this big seven days a week, let's cut it down to this big and let's do four days a week. That's one step of the puzzle. However, I have to give them something on the other side. That other side would say, instead of your chocolate cake, I want you to open a can of pineapples, have it ready in the refrigerator and snack on that when you want chocolate cake. Now, someone's gonna be like, but Nick, but Nick, chocolate cake and pineapples isn't the same. And I go, you are correct. However, the sweet sensation it gives you is very similar to the same. So I found a way to still get your chocolate cake that you enjoy, but also finding a healthy alternative. And that's going to be the key with anything healthy balance alternative so we give that mirror solution awesome thank you jordan we'd love to hear from you on this also absolutely um i am pretty my healthy eating philosophy is pretty similar to nick um you've heard of intuitive eating i'm a really big proponent of that and i wish we had time to really dive into it tonight um but we don't um so i'll just give a little bit of kind of uh, my philosophy but um, I'm all about, you know, what can we add to your food rather than take away? Um, I'd rather not restrict anything. And so um, I'm all about including healthy habits. So some of those healthy habits that I like for people to include are including a variety of nutritious foods, fruits, vegetables, etc. Having a healthy relationship with food is really important. Exercising regularly in a way that you like and enjoy, getting enough sleep, doing something every day that is beneficial for your mental health, drinking water and staying hydrated, including foods that you enjoy, like chocolate cake, eating enough, so listening to the hunger and the fullness cues that your body sends you, and understanding that food is just food, like Nick said, it doesn't have moral value. Um, You really do not need to feel guilty for eating because it's something that you need to do to stay alive. It's important, so no guilt for eating. Well, with no guilt, I'm going to ask, uh, what is your guilty uh, pleasure, Jordan? My guilty pleasure is watching The Bachelor. Definitely not any food. I don't feel guilt for eating anything. Um, All right, Nick, over to you. What's your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure is Cardi B. I don't know why, but I love me some Cardi B. Oh, Kurt, I do. I can't help it. She's my spirit animal. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I'm a busy mom with two boys. So mine is TV, couch time, and a little 90 day fiance. But anyway, <laughs> um, on to the next question. Uh, Jordan, you've mentioned that in some CF groups, you've witnessed more people with CF talking about dieting because on modulators, they're gaining weight unlike they ever have before. What do you think is important for people to know who may be considering uh, dieting? Yeah, this is definitely a big thing that we need to talk about. Um, I've noticed a lot of fad diets are um, becoming more common within the CF community. And um, some examples of those would be intermittent fasting, the keto diet or low carb, um, even gluten free, because we think that that could be healthier. Um, the reality of those diets is that, yeah, they're probably going to work short term, um, but ultimately they will likely not work long term. And there's actually research that shows that when we have a restriction in calories, um, we actually see our metabolism decrease. And when that happens, 
And that's happening because our body thinks we're in starvation mode. Um, so our metabolism decreases to help preserve our body, help preserve our fat. Um, and so we actually end up gaining more weight over time than we would have if we would have just not gone on the diet. Um, so I think it's really important to be aware of that, to know that, uh, you know, again, it may work short term, but it's not going to work long term, it may lead to more health issues over time. Um, so I would really recommend checking with your CF care team before you make any kind of dietary changes at all. Great, thank you. Um, Nick, I know you've mentioned when we've spoken before about experimenting with uh, vegan and vegetarian eating. What has, been, what has that been like, and what advice would you give to uh, people who are considering that? So first things first, uh, I want people to understand there is a stark difference between being vegan and vegetarian. Vegan is much more restricting. Uh, also, to successfully be vegan, I really recommend anyone who's considering it really take the time to do your research and take on the journey. Um, go from vegetarian and then scale down to vegan. And from my experience, I was able to really see that vegan could be a viable option. I believe there is a place for a vegan and vegetarian if that's something you choose to do, um, as I do believe there are some benefits. But one of the biggest components of it that really I found to be difficult is there's nothing quick when you're vegan. You just, there's no vegan hot pockets. So I find myself, I eat more fried food or I use an air fryer, but more fried food when I was vegan than I ever had before because I just needed something quick to eat. Um, I also found having to go to four different stores to find three different items um, instead of, okay, I can just go to one store and grab everything as a one-stop shop. So the time commitment became things. And if you're a person who already is ill or sick or not feeling well, this can be a big hurdle. Um, in addition to finding things that were naturally high calorie without having to add a lot of things to them was also kind of difficult. So you add all of these things, and I say all these things not to deter anyone, but just to understand what they got into. You know, I, as everyone knows, I'm a trained professional, and I even found myself struggling with some of the, the limitations or the restrictions of, of the diet. So I just want people to really understand that there is a place for it. You just have to be know what you're getting into and understand that it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a process, but some benefits can be seen. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Nick, uh, while we still have you here, um, what are some specific obstacles that people with CF face when, um, when it comes to maintaining healthy weight? So, there are a lot of things that can hinder maintaining that healthy weight. But one of the very first things is hospital admissions. Getting sick is, it, it makes it hard to, to maintain your weight. You get sick, it kind of knocks you down, and then you kind of on the uphill. But the other part of that, and many people may not know uh, by looking at me or just knowing my background, but I'm admitted to the hospital on average every three and a half months for 31 days. And so every time I go to the hospital, I, on average, I'm on average, excuse me, lose five to 10 pounds. So I go to the hospital, it takes, you know, six months to get my five pounds back. But as you just mentioned, I'm in the hospital again. So I've lost those same five pounds and maybe more. So it's like a snowball effect. I never seem to catch my, my basis. And as you know, when you're sick, it's hard sometimes to eat. So really just stressing those, trying to get those calories in uh, however you can drink the calories, you know, be, be mindful of them, but try to do these different things because those stress and then no doesn't even consider the other factors, for example, food deserts. And if you don't know what that is, that simply is means you're in a location or an area where healthy or nutrition foods isn't uh, readily available. And so all of these different factors can really make weight gain and maintaining weight, not just gaining uh, very difficult. There, there are many people who, with CF who struggle to gain weight, especially those who are not on modulators. Um, Jordan, can you share your experience with a feeding tube and share what um, people should be thinking about when a feeding tube is presented to them as an option? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, so I got a feeding tube about five years ago. Um, I was really struggling to gain weight. And... Um, 
my dietitian brought it out to me and I said, no, thanks. I'm good. Uh, I think I can do this on my own. And I was actually in the process of getting my bachelor's or finishing my bachelor's degree when that was first brought up to me. Um, and I continued to lose weight, couldn't keep the weight on. Um, and so she, my dietitian continued to bring it up and, um, it wasn't until I was taking a class in order to get my master's degree about feeding tubes and was talking to other people within the CF community about feeding tubes that I realized that it could be really helpful for me. So I did end up getting the feeding tube. Um, I had it for five years. I just got it removed in November. Um, but I think it's really important to, to remember that this is just one tool in our toolbox. You know, other tools that exist are eating a high calorie, high protein diet or using um, nutrition supplements like Boost or Insure or whatever that might be. And a feeding tube is just one of those one of those tools. So it's also important to remember, I know this was mentioned by DB as well, that um, it's not forever. It doesn't have to be. It can just be for a little while um, just to help you get back on your feet. Um, I think it's also important to remember too that your feelings about a feeding tube are probably not going to change overnight. Even if someone's giving you, you know, just me talking to you today, telling you you don't have to be afraid of it, it can be a really good thing. You're probably not all of a sudden going to be like, oh, you're right. You know, <laughs> I, I think it's a great idea. I think it's really important that you give yourself time to process your feelings around it. Um, for me, that took six months before I was able to say, okay, I think this is for me. Um, I think it's important for clinicians um, to dispel any myths that are out there. Make sure that you're asking your patients what concerns they have about feeding tubes in particular. Have that conversation. Um, you know, I think one thing that, that patients are afraid of is, oh, it'll be visible to everyone. Everyone will know that I have a feeding tube. And that's really just not true. So talking to your patients and having those conversations early on are really important. Great. Thank you. Nick, this question is for you. As we know, people who don't have access or can't take a modulator aren't seeing the improvements in weight and nutritional health like those who can take a modulator are. What advice would you give to people who are experiencing this from both, you know, the emotional health and good, good nutrition perspective? Um, so really, I think the simplest point that I always want to get across to people who are not on modulators as a person who's also not on modulators is that one of the hardest parts is not only is it a tough pill to swallow the fact you're not getting it, it's that anticipation that having to have people ask you if you're on one and no, no, no not yet, or your time's going to come. And I, the reason I say that is because it's very important for us as the CF community to remember Yes, people are modulators, and so we have these new set of things we need to work on, new stomach issues, weight, as we've mentioned. But we can't forget about the people over here, the tried and true, have been struggling with it who haven't received their modulators. Because their stomach issues, their GI issues, uh, their pancreatic insufficient issues still exist. So making sure we continue to find a balance to work towards finding new and in innovative ways for the people on modulators while we're still working to try to help and improve the lives of the people without. Thank you. So Nick and Jordan, but as both registered dietitians and CF patients, how can registered dietitians, doctors, and other clinicians have healthy and open conversations with patients and parents about weight, nutrition, and body image? Jordan, let's hear from you first. Yeah, so I do think um, it's really important to remember that these conversations about weight, nutrition, and body image are all very sensitive topics. Um, sometimes our culture gets so wrapped up in the fact that, or the idea, not the fact, um, that thin equals healthy, and that's just not always true. Um, so as clinicians, please remind your patients that the number on the scale says nothing about their value as a person, and it says nothing about their overall health. It's really the habits that we keep that tell us the most about our health. In addition to that, as clinicians, I always try to remember that we have two ears and we have one mouth for a reason. So try to listen so much more than you speak. Um, I always try to ask my patients what their goals are um, because I don't want to tell them what my goals are and then not listen to what they what they want for themselves. Ultimately, if, a, if I have a goal for a patient that is different um, from their own, they're less likely to stick to my recommendations and even open up to me. 
Um, I think it's really important to remember that the patient knows their body best. Um, the metaphor that I really like to use in situations um, like this is or in regards to the patient-client relationship um, is that our patients are the drivers in the car and we are the GPS system. So we can tell them where to go and how to get there, but ultimately it's their decision on whether or not they choose to follow. Okay, thank you. Nick, if you can share yours real quick because we're getting short on time. What are your thoughts uh, on this? So very quickly, the thing I think is most important is having an open and honest conversation with not putting your own pre conceived notions about these things onto it. Um, example I'll use very quickly is, as I am a person who for all extensive purposes, I'm thin, I, I'm, I look fit, but I suffer from body weight images myself. And I once told my clinician, I was feeling a little flabby, I needed to exercise. And their response was, I'll take that kind of flab any day. And it, to them, that was like a, a fun, to me, it's like, I just, I shared something which was seemingly extremely personal to me and you all you're able to see it was from your lens and how you would view it. So just be mindful as clinicians to have these conversations. They are sensitive. Be mindful that have these conversations open honestly and be sensitive to the to the fact that someone's sharing something sensitive with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so the next question, um, uh, based on what we know about the population of registered dietitians. They typically come from a particularly privileged position in our society. How does this position of authority that they have hold overall affect the, the patient and clinician relationship? How can we bring the awareness to the differences in life experience between someone who's a dietitian and the patients and parents um, who are coming from so many different walks of life? Jordan, will you go first? Yes. So typically, registered dietitians look a lot like me. Um, they're white, they are female, and have advanced degrees. Um, and what we do know is that the lack of diversity among healthcare professionals um, has been an issue for a very long time. Um, and within the dietetic profession, it's no different. Um, the typical RD, like myself, has a very narrow view of what healthy eating looks like, and it's typically not inclusive of other cultures and the food that they might consume. Um, research also shows that the lack of representation with, uh, in healthcare professionals can actually lead to a disconnect between the providers and their patients. Um, there could be barriers to communication that discourage patients from sharing important information, um, and this can affect the quality of care that's provided. Um, so to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm going to be very vulnerable here with you all today, but when this question was first presented to me, um, I really didn't see the importance of it at first, and I'm very embarrassed and saddened by that. Um, I, I couldn't give an answer really at first um, because this has never been brought to my attention before. Um, I think that you know plays into my privilege. Um, I think this is really part of the problem. So I was really embarrassed that I couldn't give an answer. Um, I didn't see how important this conversation really is, and so I had to take a step back and really dive into the research um, and just see and recognize that my background and my place of privilege can affect the relationship that I have with my parent, my patients, even if I don't want it to. So I would really encourage clinicians to take a step back and recognize that this is important to be aware of. Um, even if you don't think that your, your, your position plays uh, a role in your relationship with your client, it, it might. So do your own research, do your own work to learn how your background can affect the relationships that you have with your own patients. Thanks, Jordan. Nick, we would love to hear your perspective on this. So before I get into it, I just want to, I'm going to go through some numbers as to really understand and echo the, the disparity as far as the nutrition population. So as of March 29, 2021, the dietary profession is comprised of 93.9% .9 female, 3.7% male, and 2.4% unreported. Of that percentage, 81.1% is female, as uh, white as white. So think about that. Of that 94%, 81% is white female, with 2.6% being African American. I am less than as a person of color in this uh, profession. I am essentially less than 2% of my entire profession. 
And this is so staggering and so important because when the conversation got brought up, and I want to thank Jordan, and I'm going to use her as the example. Uh, as she mentioned, she was kind of hesitant at first, but Jordan is the gold standard because she was resistant at first, and then she took a step back, and then I see all these, I did this research, I found this research. And the reason that's important is because no one's asking anyone to know something. A lot of times, as Jordan mentioned, it's not on the radar initially. It has to, when, but the key is, when it's brought to your attention, when it's brought to someone's attention, that you're able to step back and recognize the place in which you're viewing the answer or question from, and that you're willing, you're making the willing effort to then go do something about it. And that's all we can ask. And that's all anyone can ask of any person. Identify and then try to better yourself in the situation. Um, one example I wanna uh, give you guys to end with is as clinicians, it is so important that we give information and advice based on the information they give us and not the things we want to give. And I use this example with say you have a, I know someone mentioned in the chat, you have a patient who's a teen, a 15 year old teen who doesn't wanna take her enzymes because she doesn't want her friends to know that she has a disease. The answer can't be, it's okay, your enzymes are important, your friends are gonna have to accept you the way you are. That's not our place. Our place is to use our expertise to say, okay, go to the bathroom, take your enzymes, and then come back and your friends will never know. It is our job as clinicians to give answers based on the information and the questions that are being asked to us, not what we think should be answered. And that goes so well into this because it's our job as people, clinicians, to get information, assess, and then provide solutions based on that information know better, do better. And Jordan was a prime example for that. And I challenge everyone else to be an example. Know better, do better. And with that, that's the thing that I would advance for everyone. That's my advice for everyone out there. Know better, do better. Thank you. Um, the takeaway is that it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation. However, they are extremely important for the betterment of our patients. Having people like you, Nick, is, is it's inspiring to see. Um, often people just need to see someone who looks like them and think of a career path that's viable for them. So thank you for being here today. Thank you both to Jordan and Nick for this really great and important conversation. And I'm just gonna invite everybody back on. We unfortunately are out of time for Q&A for just a quick short message from everybody. If DB and um, Janine could please come back on real quick. And we'll start uh, in the order we started. DB, go right ahead. Well, uh, I just thanks again for everybody for participating tonight. I guess for everybody who viewed this, I would say that um, you're gonna have to educate your teams on what Nick and Jordan just educated you on. Um, and uh, you know, us clinicians, we're not just focused on the numbers, but uh, I think it's really helpful to hear their viewpoints. Um, I love our nutritionists at Riley, but I wish Nick and Jordan would come work with us and help me uh, work with our families. So thank you. Thank you. Janine? Oh, yes. Well, it's been wonderful to be together this evening and to try to emphasize uh, how important nutrition is and what a unique time we are for CF and nutrition. And as everybody has said, how do we get the balance? We don't want to leave behind the people who are still having more trouble. I think we definitely can learn to manage and anticipate the the potential weight gain uh, with the new medicines. And I'm really just proud to be a part of the team tonight and look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Uh, Jordan? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with um, everyone. I'm, I'm so excited to have been a part of this session. Um, I definitely would just say thank you all so much to everyone who has attended tonight. I hope that we have given you some new, um, some new things to think about. Uh, there's been lots of good information here. So definitely, um, like Dr. Sanders said, please talk to your care team about some of these things. Um, these are all great conversations to have. Thank you. Nick, any last uh, words? Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, very simple. Be the change, be the difference. 
of it. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for presenting today and for joining the discussion.